Good morning. Thank you so much, Ed and uh, Kevin, for having us. It's, um, uh, Strata is just the event to talk about data, and it's fantastic. I'm just fan feel fantastically lucky to, to be here with so many people from so many areas, such a kind of broad, of uh, such a, a broad area. And I suppose what we're going to talk about is I'm not going to talk today about um, you know kind of some of the big stuff which you may have heard of, like the work on the riots or WikiLeaks or even um, MPs' expenses. But I guess what I'm talking about is really kind of how we do it day to day. And I'm going to talk for a little bit. And Catherine uh, from Google, who's been with us for last week, is going to talk about it from a much more kind of you know, a knowledgeable perspective, having kind of watched us, um, us kind of uh, hacking around at work. But um, I suppose the first thing to say, what we do, I'll talk a bit about kind of what we do and how it works day to day, is what we do is, is very much kind of open data journalism. And what I mean by that is not just kind of Google spreadsheets, although there's a lot of that going on, but it's this idea that in the past, journalism was very much kind of a one-way process. I would sit in my ivory tower, I would hand out my pearls of wisdom to you, and you would gratefully receive them. Um, and say thank you, and that was it. But much more of a kind of a two-way process now, and it's much more about kind of trying to engage the people who are out there looking at what we do and trying to make them part of the process. So I'm going to talk a bit about how we do that. Um, I, never, I try never to do a speech without uh, James Cameron. I don't mean the director of Avatar. Uh, this is uh, James Cameron from The Guardian, 1950s, 1960s, fantastic journalist in Vietnam and Korea. And he says essentially that you know, facts should never get in the way of truth. And what I take that to mean is essentially that numbers on their own are just numbers, right? They're, they need that context, that kind of uh, furniture that we can build around them to kind of bring them to life and make them real for people. So kind of how does that work for us? Um, I suppose the first thing to say is, you know, what is a data journalist? People often say, you know, a data journalist is this and that. I think um, it's important to first look at kind of what, a data, what a journalist does. I've kind of honed it down to what I think the kind of the basics of that are. So, you know, investigating, researching, writing, reporting maybe exposing and revealing a truth that we didn't know before, but also engaging your readership, making people feel part of what you're doing. So what does a data journalist do? What does a data journalist do that's so different to that? Writing, engaging, investigating, researching. These are the same things. You've just got new ways to do it, new tasks, and new kind of methods of doing the same process and kind of bringing stuff to life in the same way. So um, what we've done is poor Catherine has been sat with us for a week. And this was our week. This is what we did last week. I'm going to talk a bit about this, talk a bit about what we did during the Olympics as well. So the first kind of rule of, um, of what we do, I suppose, is about making data public, but also kind of finding the key data behind the story. So when a story breaks, we're looking at what is the most interesting data we can kind of surface and reveal about this. So this is our week. We do um, most of our stuff, uh, certainly through the data blog. Data store goes by the data store front. So every day we get the news, uh, we'll look at the news list and we'll think, what's, on, what's going on today? What's important? What's interesting? And what can we talk about? So this is last week, so we had um, GDP figures out, uh, which is that big red line, by the way, is the present recession. The blue one behind it is the Great Depression. So um, th that's the kind of thing we'll try and do, kind of, you know, make that data available. Because actually GDP data is a complete nightmare to deal with. Anybody who's worked with the ONS website, there's about 10 different measures. So how do you know where to go? So we've kind of made that decision. We looked at academy schools, partly because um, my daughter's school is about to become an academy. I thought, well, who are the sponsors? Who are these people? Where are academy schools? How many are there? And thousands of these schools are happening now. The half of all secondary schools are academy schools. But try and find out who the sponsors are. And you kind of run up against a wall of data sets. So what we had together was we had a list of all the open academies. We had a list of the ones that were about to open. We had another list of ones that applied, some of which were on the list that were about to open with different reference numbers. <laughs> And we also had this other thing called the Spine, which is this kind of hidden DfE website, which has data about every school, like how many pupils they have, free school meal pupils, and so on. So we brought all that stuff together to try and make it useful for people as a kind of a, a guide to how it works. We also looked at aid last week with um, David Cameron having to defend the, the government's position of maintaining the Millennium Goals aid target against a lot of Tory MPs who'd rather they dropped it. And so this is working again with the graphics team, trying to bring that kind of key data to life. We also had this rather weird, nuanced um, piece of data from the ONS, which was uh, the, this kind of update of the census. And it had one key interesting thing, which was the number of people in each age group for each year. So we could actually start to show where are all the babies, and this is where all the babies are. So that's our kind of week. And of course, uh, the Doctor Who uh, most important post probably done in the last three years is the list of every single Doctor Who villain which we first did it, we had, we had about 150 people, 150 villains, and we immediately had about 300 comments, most of which were corrections or additions. <laughs> Don't mess with uh, Dot Who fans, is what I'd say, but also, this is something we kind of keep updating. And it's that, you know, just like editing a newspaper, working in data journalism, it's all about balance, a balance of the light and the shade, and trying to kind of 
you know, bring to life the stuff that's out there. And then there's this, which some of you might have seen before, but you probably won't have seen this one. This is the first time we've shown this. This is the latest uh, government spending charts, which again is a complete uh, hellish nightmare to get, because as the government, or although the government is publishing more and more, these very, very granular, tiny data sets like spending over 500 pounds, you want to find out how much the department is spending, that's actually tricky. You've got to get it from the annual reports, which come out every July. But this year, we're missing already uh, the Ministry of Defence and the Department of Health and the DCMS, the three of the biggest departments in government. Those are those greyed out circles there. We don't know how much they've spent. So this is uh, kind of the, the scandal of government spending that we're going to have to wait till November before we can um, show something, some figures that finished eight months earlier. So although we have a lot of this very detailed data, a lot of what we're trying to do is kind of make stuff clear and available for people. Um, this is our kind of workflow. Um, work, uh, flow charts are not something I'd ever thought I'd stand on the stage to talk about, but this is kind of really how it works for us. So we often start with uh, an idea, or there might be an obsession of somebody in the office, uh, like Doctor Who, um, or we'll start with something like a breaking news story at the riots and so on, and then we'll start to think, what can we do with this? And what often people do is they present all this data and think, right, well, I must chart it, I must visualise it straight away. But we'll often pause there and think, what is the kind of journalistic question we want to know? What's the important thing about this data that's going to make it interesting? What stories are going on? When we had the WikiLeaks data set, um, you know, we were looking at improvised explosive devices because we knew there was a story there. So often you start with that, and then you start, the, kind of the, key, the key bits of data journalism are probably the most simple statistical task. Has something got bigger or smaller? How does it compare to something else? How has it changed over time? Often, that's where we're looking. A very, very simple uh, question, because they're simple for us to explain their simples of somebody to understand. And then that word, that 80% of data journalism involves this kind of tedious process of going through messy data sets. Often you get things that look pretty, but they've got hidden cells and merge columns, and unnecessary columns, different formats of data. So we're kind of bringing that stuff all together. And then you get to the fun bit at the end, which is kind of how does this stuff look? And um, often you look at something, that's a great story. This is the best story. And then you can think, well, is it really? And often, if you think it's a great story, it's because it's wrong. And that's where you have, kind of have to take a step back and think, is that that's so good, it can't be right, I must check it again. That kind of, you know, not always relying on the, um, the algorithms is really, really important. And then right at the end is the output. And that output, you know, often we show charts and visualizations, but as Jake said, it doesn't have to be a graph, you know. Just publishing a number that you worked hard to get can be interesting for people. Or publishing, or we'll go to our amazing kind of graphics team or the interactive team. Um, or use some of the free tools. Now, often we use free tools just because partly we don't have any money and partly because I feel everything we do should be replicable. Everything we do on the site, somebody else should be able to do as well. To almost test, that we're, test our honesty, test we're being right. So I'm, uh, I'm running out of time now. I'm going to talk very, very quickly about the, uh, the Olympics. The Olympics was a situation where there is a lot of data, a lot of Olympic data out there, but not much of it is open. It's, uh, the IOC publishes data, but they sell it. They sell these feeds. And one of the conditions of buying a feed, like we do, is that you don't make it available. But obviously, the data, all we do is make data available. So how can we kind of open that stuff up? So we look to kind of, partly what we do, I suppose, we expose these kind of big historical data sets, like every medal winner. Or we start to look at where the money comes from. You know, just even finding out where LOCOG spends its money and where the Olympic Delivery Authority got, it money, got its money from is kind of the key thing. And actually, not that easy to do. So we kind of work a lot on that. We also started collecting raw data from the results as well. So every medal winner, every um, event, every athlete score, and just published that stuff. Just made it available for other people to download and, and do stuff with. Uh, we had a lot of quick hits where we do stuff in the morning. So at 9 in the morning, 9 or 10 in the morning, news editor would say, so who's winning Team, G, Team GB medals? Who are these people? So we'd just start analysing stuff, get lists together and using kind of Spreadsheet charts, um, because they're easy and easy to update, just Google charts. Might do something like, you know, uh, how many uh, of our medal winners went to private school, or um, uh, if Michael Phelps was a country, where would he be? <laughs> just, above, uh, just above North Korea. Um, and then we also, because everybody, I don't even remember, on day four, everybody was panicking in the UK that we weren't winning any gold medals. So um, we start to think, well, how does this time really compare to 2008? So we just did a day-by-day -day thing where every day, we just kind of fill in the medal details that day, and it would update this uh, visualization, and it was just, you know, useful and kind of available. And the other thing we wanted to do was, obviously, we're all obsessed with medal tables, you know, where's China, where's the US? So we thought, what can we bring with that data? So we thought, what if we weighted it by things like population or GDP 
or team size? What difference would that make to the league table? So we worked with some statisticians at Imperial College. I could have kind of hacked it together, but I thought it was important to be statistically rigorous. And they created this fantastic uh, set of formulas for us in spreadsheet. All we had to do every day was just fill in the latest uh, medal winners. And uh, every day you could see the medal table by population, GDP, or team size. If you look at uh, you know, GDP, suddenly Grenada, tiny population, tiny economy, with its one gold medal, shoots to the top of the table. North Korea bombs up. Um, and so on. And just having that kind of thing, that different way of looking at the story, I think really led us to tell other stories as well. And working, often data journalism, a lot of data journalism is about finding friends, people like Catherine or the statisticians at Imperial College who can kind of help us day to day um, do what we want to do. And it means at the end of the games, we could do stuff like this, where we could give the graphics team ready spreadsheets, we had all the results, we didn't have to suddenly kind of come up with this stuff from, from nowhere and really kind of you know, tell the story that way. Um, and the other thing is, just very quickly, is that um, I suppose everybody's heard Jeff Jarvis' thing, you know, do what you do best and link to the rest. And often a lot of what we do is about sharing what other people have done, whether it's um, stuff like this, from, this interactive from the Kiln Project, which basically resized Britain depending on where um, Olympic medalists have come from, or this project with um, Help Me Investigate, Paul Bradshaw's brilliant unit. We're basically looking at the torches. There was 8,000 torch places. We all thought, oh, they're going to be carried by war heroes and so on. Actually, only a few of them were. Well, basically about half. But they had lots out there which were sponsors, had organised people to run. There might be company directors. Whether who were these people? And help me investigate, help look at them. So that's kind of what we do day to day. Now, Catherine, I'm going to hand it to Catherine now, who's been uh, sitting with us, slogging through this for the last week. She's going to talk a bit about kind of how it works from her point of view. Thanks, Simon. And like Simon mentioned, I had the amazing opportunity to sit with Simon's data blog team at The Guardian last week and experience firsthand how they worked. And while I was there, I was really struck by three major learnings. First, the news drives the stories behind the data blog posts. Simon's team is right in the middle of The Guardian newsroom. Because of this, they can stay abreast of the hottest stories and they can post blog posts with supporting data and visualizations. Second, data journalism moves at an extremely fast pace. Data might come in at 1 p.m. and has to get out the door in a story by 4. This means that tools that are quick and easy to use reign supreme. So keeping these items in mind, let's take a look at how you can apply some of the Guardian's data strategies to your own work. First and foremost, if you learn nothing else from The Guardian, is that you have to know what's important. Whether this is what's going, out in the, going on in the sales field, or on your company's website, or even in global news, you have to find the stories that matter to you and your audience. Once you've found that story, you next have to find the supporting data. And there's a lot of data out there. You might have some data that's being collected by your company, or just a lot of public sources for data as well. Governments at both the local and national level are starting to open up their data and post that data on their websites. You can also find a lot of interesting data on the World Bank website or even Google's Public Data Explorer. And once you have that data, you often find that the first thing that you have to do is clean up the data. So here's an example of some data that Simon was working with last week. And if you take a look at the last column, you can see that this data set refers to the Cabot Learning Federation in several different ways. And this makes your data analysis practically impossible. So here are a few tools that you can use to help clean up your data. The Guardian has been using Google Refine. Um, data Wrangler is another good option. And both these tools allow you to find similarly named uh, entities in your data set and fix any inconsistencies. Another thing to think about while you're collecting your data is that sometimes the data that you have just isn't enough. And you might want to supplement that data with other data sets. Simon was talking about how they were able to combine the Olympic medal count with GDP to create a more compelling story. In your case, you might want to combine sales figures with population and poverty statistics to get a fuller understanding of your story. Once you have that supporting data, how do you merge that data with your data sets? Here are a few tools that you can use to merge different data sets together. The Guardian excels at using Microsoft's Excel VLOOKUP function to combine data from multiple spreadsheets into a single data set. You can also use a relational database or Google Fusion tables. 
Now that you have your data, it's been cleaned, you've merged it with other data sets, it's time to tell the story. And if you take a look at the Guardian's data blog post, you often see a well-crafted visualization that accompanies their stories. These visualizations are interactive and uh, they give the reader to the ability to explore the data and understand the story better. The visualizations are often consist of maps or charts or sometimes they're built specially in-house. Um, and like I mentioned, the visualizations are interactive and they allow the, the reader to explore the data. One good example of this is the Guardian's map visualizations. They often have an accompanying postcode search box that zooms into the entered postcode. This personalizes the story and allows the reader to enter in their own postcode and find data for the area that they live in. So how do you make these visualizations? This is not an exhaustive list of map tools. These are just a few tools that the Guardian likes to use. So there's Google Fusion Tables, Google Maps API, CardoDB, and all these tools allow you to create customizable, embeddable maps and easily place these maps in your website. Charts are another popular visualization on the Guardian data blog. And um, these are a few vi visualization tools that help you create charts. Um, so first, Google Spreadsheets, Data Wrapper, and Tableau. And similar to the maps tools, these help you create customizable, embeddable charts for your website. Finally, there's one more important piece that you might want to consider before sharing your story. And uh, this is sharing the accompanying data that you found um, to create your story. If you look at the Guardian's da data blog post, you often see that they have a link for you to download the raw data that accompanies the story. This is important because it allows the reader to explore the raw data and maybe find their own stories or confirm the, the story that uh, the Guardian was telling. One awesome feature of the Guardian's data sharing is that it's accessible online. So the Guardian doesn't just upload a CSV file or an Excel file. They put that data in a Google spreadsheet or a fusion table and link to that resource online. With spreadsheets, you can even see how many people are viewing the spreadsheet at one time, which gives you an idea of how popular your story is. Um, and one thing that you might not think about immediately is that both these tools have an accompanying API. So if you want application developers to use your data in their applications, you might want to consider putting your data in one of these tools. So what tools are available? Um, like I mentioned, the Guardian uses Google Spreadsheets and Google Fusion Tables. You might also want to consider using BigQuery as well, which handles very large data sets, think terabytes of data. So how can we help? While I was at the Guardian, I noticed a few pain points that delayed their story get in getting out quickly. First of all, while it's great that we have all these visualization tools to help people create visualizations with just a couple clicks of the mouse, often to create fully interactive, searchable visualizations, a bit of code is required. And in the fast-paced environment at the Guardian, there's not much time to write code and debug that code. So what's the solution? Um, let's continue to iterate and develop these tools and make the visualizations more and more complex and more and more interactive without the user having to write a single line of code. Next, well, it's very awesome that all these organizations, governments are starting to share their data online and make this, this, these data sets available to the public. It's absolutely critical that this data be provided in a machine-readable format. Here's an example of some data that was uh, posted online by a data provider. And um, as you can see, it's formatted for visual purposes. Now imagine trying to upload this data set to your favorite data analysis tool or trying to merge it with other data sets. You're gonna have to move data from one column to another. You might have to delete columns. This is time consuming and can lead to human errors. So the solution? Ideally, it would be great if we could have and decide upon a single data format for online data sharing. Imagine a world where all the data online was in the single data format, and all the tools could speak the same language. Not only could you move your data from tool to tool, but um, search engines could greatly benefit from the single data format. 
In fact, even browsers could begin to interpret the data and display it in new and interesting ways. All right. Sorry. Pat, to get just, over to, <laughs> just to wrap up, I mean, I, obviously, thanks, Catherine, for being with us for the week, and thanks for, thanks for listening to us. You know, I feel very lucky in what I do. When I started in journalism, you know, if you told me I'd be working with numbers, I would have laughed in your face. I was terrible at maths at school, like many people in England. This is a, a national, national problem, not just me. Um, but, you know, what it's about, what this is about, is just that we have so many ways of telling stories now. And that's really all we're trying to do is just tell stories. And, you know, I think in, I really hope that we get invited to, the, to Strata in, you know, 2025. But, um, you know, it might be by then this is just not unusual. Every journalist does this because, you know, at the root of what we're doing, it's just all about telling stories. Thank you.